Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for KB Talks powered by the NKBA, the only podcast dedicated to sharing the latest kitchen and bath industry insights, providing you with the education and connections to help grow and support your business. I'm your host, Jennifer Bertrand. This episode was recorded live from the KBiz Next Stage in Las Vegas this past January. How long ago that seems now. This week, we're bringing you an in-depth conversation between famed designer, author, and KBB Person of the Year, Matthew Quinn, and Chelsea Butler, Executive Editor of Kitchen and Bath Business Magazine. Listen in as they dive into Matthew's design process, get the inside scoop on the expansion of Design Galleria, and hear what keeps him inspired. How's everybody's first day going? (laughs) <laughs> Yay. All right. Well, I have sitting with me um, KBB's first person of the year. He was awarded that last year. It's a pretty obvious choice. <laughs> um, he is principal of Atlanta-based Design Galleria Kitchen and Bath Studio and is planning to open a new location in Nashville later on this year. Mm-hmm. He's the author of two books that highlight residential spaces, and he has designed awesome products for several well-known brands in the industry. I had the good fortune of meeting you about six or seven years ago, I think, when I first started with Kitchen and Bath Business Magazine, and I'm very excited to learn more about you with our conversation today. Cool. So let me get started. <laughs> I feel like I need a cocktail first. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can someone help? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So did you always know that you wanted to be a designer and specifically the kitchen and bath design industry? No, uh, not at all. I... Grew up in Key West, Florida. My father was uh, principal of the elementary school. And then when I went to middle school, became principal of the middle school. And then when I went to high school, became principal of the high school. So it literally like followed me. And we had summers off back then. The principals had summers off. So we would build or renovate a house every summer. So, uh, you know, yes, I was exposed to building Um, I was more exposed to painting and sanding and filling holes and, you know, doing work like that. But I was exposed to it. My father wanted me, my mother was a hospice nurse. They wanted me to be a doctor. Okay. So I went to University of Florida. Me too. I know, that's right. (laughs) And have a degree in chemistry and moved to somehow, I do pretty well on tests. So somehow I did well on the MCAT and was accepted to Emory in Atlanta, which is why I moved to Atlanta. And I lasted six days, <laughs> had a total anxiety attack, um, knew I had no desire to be a doctor at all. And so I flew to Paris, got on, used my credit card, flew to Paris, called my parents from Paris and told them that I quit. And because I knew they wouldn't come over there and kick my ass, so I, I quit. So I, it took me, they cut off my credit cards. It took me about a month to make money being a waiter and doing stuff like that to afford my ticket back. I mean, literally, it was, they were so upset. Got back to Atlanta, and there is a, I went to Georgia Tech, because after being a month in Paris, you want to be an architect. So I went to Georgia Tech. They said nothing transferred from my chemistry degree, so you'd have to start over. So I interviewed the design schools there, and there's one design school there that 80% of the staff were architects. So they were very, very heavy into space planning. So I, that's what I picked. I picked that school. And my very second class of Drafting 101, the owner of Design Galleria Kitchen and Bath Studio called the school and said, I'm looking for a draftsman. And I um, applied for the position. He said, you know, you got... You, there was two people that applied for it. One of them was a, a freshman architecture student at Georgia Tech. But he said my smile was better than his. <laughs> so I got the job and just have, honest to God, just been totally in love with kitchens ever since. I mean, it's, to me, it's almost the closest thing, I guess, to architecture because it's so space planning um, concentrated. And I love, I guess, because of my chemistry background, I love the scientific part of it. Um, Not only from the materials, but from saving time. I mean, everything, the organization, all all that kind of stuff. So 
no, I had no, I had no idea I was going to get into design until I finally kind of, you know, stood up to my parents and said, no, I don't want to be a doctor. Right. So do you prefer designing kitchens over bathrooms? Uh, good question. I don't, I would say they're different. Uh, designing kitchens, I really do study the client when it comes to bad habits, good habits, the science of inventory, uh, the science of ergonomics, how to save them time. So I get really focused on that, and you know, then, then you make it pretty. Bathrooms, the function aspect is a little bit different. It, it's, it's got a, maybe the comfort level has to be right first. I really love designing closets. Okay. Um, that's really what I'm like 30, 35% of my day right now is basically designing closets. And it's kind of like, uh, I like fashion. So it's almost like designing stores. I mean, that's what my clients want. They want stores. So you, one of the first questions, of course, is, you know, what's your favorite store? Is it Tom Ford? Is it Dior? Is it whatever? So you, then you know those stores and you kind of design accordingly that, that right. that's what they like. Okay. So besides the um, trip to Paris and mm -hmm. with no <laughs> return ticket, were there any other leaps of faith you took as your career was developing? Uh, I mean, I feel like there's leaps of faith for, uh, I mean, just every day, honestly. But it, I, I would say the biggest leap of faith was buying the business. So I... I was in school for two years. I worked as a draftsman for two years. I literally was in a closet, a, a four-foot-wide closet. The AC was directly above me. Every time it turned on, I thought for sure it was going to crush me. And this is back, I mean, I don't know if anyone's going to remember, this is back when you had the, it's like a three-foot-wide board, and it had the rolling drafts, you know, and you had the zzz eraser. And I had, you know, you leave work, and you're just covered in eraser bits. Um, <laughs> like old school drafting. And what was the question? Oh, so, <laughs> so I finished school and I'm doing actually pretty well. I'm actually loving what I'm doing. And we have a conversation with the owner who was getting older, didn't really have a legacy plan. And we said, hey, um, we'd like to buy the business from you. And I think that was probably the biggest leap of faith okay. is to, to really decide that this, instead of starting your own company, to buy an existing company. The company had an amazing reputation, had great products, and uh, I think that was the biggest leap of faith. And then the, and the arrangement was, because again, I was totally poor, um, what we did is I, he asked me, what is the minimum you can live on? And I think it was like $22,000. And everything I made over that would go towards a down payment on the business. So after, I think it was five years, I had, a, I had saved enough money to give him a down payment. And then it took us, I guess, three years to uh, buy it outright. He held the note and buy it outright. So that was, I mean, it, it was eight years of like making nothing, right? but um, God, it was so worth it. So I would say that's the biggest leap of faith. Yeah, okay. So you're a kitchen and bath designer, but you also design a, a number of products. Can you talk about how you got involved with that and maybe some of your favorite brand relationships? Sure. Um, I am uh, very blessed to have uh, great clients, and a lot of them want products that solve a very specific problem or they want products that no one else has. So therefore, I was already kind of designing one-offs. And some of these things worked so well that it just made sense for, you know, to uh, have them mass marketed and, and take them to a manufacturer. So my first product, um, was honest, it was the corner sink. I mean, I had designed that t 10 years ago and I could not find a manufacturer. We went down many, many companies and so many of them just did not understand it. And um, that was, I think, 
I have, I work with eight companies right now. I have licenses with eight companies right now. And I think Julian Home Improvements was maybe the seventh. So it took me seven companies until I finally okay. got that deal. But my first deal was with MTI Babs. They're right there in Swanee, Georgia. Russell Adams is the owner and he is similar in that like, he's super creative and he loves to dabble in things and he's always sketching like I am and he just wants to constantly do something new. And that was my first, I, I saw his collection of bathtubs. I love a factory tour. So what I like to do with all the manufacturers, uh, my licensing partners, is I like to go and visit the factory and kind of see what they think their limitations are. And I guess because of my background with my dad building houses, I could see like, oh, you know what? I think they could probably go a little further than what they're thinking. And I will design products that kind of push that. And with, with Russell, and MTI baths, I kind of did that. And we came up with some amazing bathtubs and sinks and have a new one coming out very shortly that will, it will, it will save marriages. I'm just saying that. It's in, it's in the bathroom. It's going to save marriages. Um, so I've got something coming out with him. And then from that, um, Art for Every Day, Francois and Company has my hood collections. Uh, Sun Valley Bronze Hardware, Hayfala has hardware with me, La Cornu, I have a new modern range coming out with La Cornu, um, Acto, a tile collection with Acto. Um, so it's fun. I, I am always sketching. I have three notebooks full of product that have, don't even have a home yet. Right. I'm just always sketching things. Yeah. So. And I've talked to you about this, I think, when I visited your showroom in Atlanta before. You said something about Maybe not liking product design better, but you said it was different somehow. It, they, they definitely go hand in hand. Like, I, I actually think you are a better product designer if you keep your foot in design. Like, if you're just designing product, you're not having an inter interface with the client and seeing all the challenges that they have. So I like doing both. I probably like, at this point, how long have I been, been doing this? 26 years. At this point... I like probably product design better because it doesn't talk back. It doesn't email me. It doesn't, you know, like it's just, it's me in the product and I'm not having to deal with clients as amazing as they are. Um, I'm not having to deal with the clients so much. Yeah. Okay. So what's the best advice you've ever given? Maybe uh, I'll start out with what's the best advice you ever received and then yeah. in turn that you've given. I'd, my dad, um, he lived by the golden rule, taught all of us children to live by the golden rule, you know, treat others as you want to be treated. Um, in, in everything, we always put ourselves in that other person's shoes and however we're acting to them, expect to be, you know, reciprocated. And it, it so much so like my own team they will literally tell me this. They're like, why do you try so hard to save your rich clients money? And it's because I, I put myself in their shoes and want to make sure that I, they see value in what we're providing to them and they see value in the products that we're specifying. So I, I, it, to me, it's always the golden rule as far as uh, the best advice I've been given. Or, I mean, I, I literally live by it. Right. So would you say that is the best advice you've given to? I don't, I don't, um, <coughs> given probably what I'm preaching more than anything to our team is, and even our clients, is to think long-term, not short-term. Um, think about, yes, this is an expensive room that we're renovating, but really think long-term about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, select materials that are more sustainable, select materials that are high quality, that are going to perform well, that have a great reputation. Um, even <sighs> social media, um, the book, like going through business, going through life, just always thinking long-term and not satisfying an itch right, right now, but thinking, thinking more long-term about it. So right. it's probably what I preach more than anybody and say, okay, now what's this decision going to look like in five years? How are you going to think about this decision in five years? Okay. My, my dad, again, it always goes back to my dad. I don't know why, but we were, my two sisters, I'm the oldest. We had to put in our rooms, this sounds cruel, but 
we had to put a plan A, B, and C on poster board starting at age seven. And we had to do that all the way through high school. So we had to plan A, B, and C and make sure that we followed that plan. And if something happened, like we, you know, got a B for God's sake, then what happens? And you go to plan B, that type of thing. So we follow those plans all the way through. And I get, obviously, that is ingrained in me that I'm always thinking that plan A, B, and C and always thinking, you know, a few steps ahead. All right. Okay. So is that cruel? Is that so cruel? <laughs> <laughs> a no, seven-year-old, I... like, and I go to college. And, <laughs> right. No, I mean, I think that, you know, shapes you into who you're going to be and prepares right. you for a lot of, of, you know, the stresses that you have when you right. get older, too. So right. you're more prepared than I'm sure a lot of us are. Right. So. <laughs> um, so what stands out as a couple of the really... Um, really great projects you've worked on. I know we've got some pictures of some, but what stand out in your mind as like really great achievements? Yeah, I, I am asked that question often and for whatever reason, I never think of the project. I always think of the people. Okay. Uh, I have to be so connected to the person that lives in that space. I mean, I think that's why I am not a formulaic designer. I, every one of these images look like it maybe not look like the same designer because they're so different looking. They look like the person living there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do, I think about the people. There, there's an image on here, and I meant to catch Jill before she left. It's the cover of Traditional Home right now. And um, it's a beautiful blue and white traditional kitchen in McLean, Virginia. And this client, I did her house in Atlanta, and she has an um, autoimmune disease that's her, it's eating at her lung cells, basically. So when I met her in Atlanta, she only had 17% lung capacity. And it was the first house where we were, and of course, being a scientist, it, every little decision had to be thought about as far as the air quality, the outgassing, like everything in that kitchen. And... She is the most beautiful woman, the most kind woman, the most fun woman. The, she has such great taste. And then she moved to McLean to be closer to her grandchild. And we did the same process, but it was a house from scratch. So I was advising on everything about that house, how to build this house so it was healthy for her. And... Um, she's, uh, she's not doing very well. She has been in the house about a year now. And um, it, I meant to tell Jill that she's on the, you know, she got the cover of Traditional Home. And uh, it's like, a, I, I don't expect her to last more than a couple weeks. There it is right there. I don't expect her to last more than a couple weeks. And um, I was able to deliver that cover, that magazine to her last Monday. And uh, I just put a, you know, such a huge smile on her face. And of course, a huge smile on my face. So, ugh, sorry, I, but to get back to it, it's really about the people. It's, it's about those challenges. It's about all the different personalities. I mean, I, I did the largest single family residence in Hong Kong. I mean, that was amazing. There was 20 bathrooms and five kitchens. Wow. Absolutely amazing, so much fun. Um, we have lots of projects in Bermuda right now, just finished one in Belize. So I love all that different architecture and different influences, but at the same time, like we're getting, there's a, charity in Atlanta called Meals on Wheels that uh, serves food to the elderly. And they just asked us to design their kitchens and make them fun for all the volunteers that come in to interact with that. And that's like, I'm so excited about that because it's very different than the typical kind of residential mm -hmm. kitchen. So, I, I mean, I have a 2,000 square foot closet right now in Dallas, Texas that's two floors high. Um, so much fun. I, we designed a glass staircase in the middle of it. She has 970 pairs of shoes. Oh my God. You know, so like I, I'm <laughs> super excited. About, I, I, that gets installed in about two months. You know, it took four years to get to this point. And uh, so things like that, yeah, they get me excited. Mm -hmm. so I like doing things different, you know, clearly. Yeah. So in terms of your international projects, like how does that work? How do they find you? How are you able to make the time for that when you're based here? I'm always on the road. Um, the Hong Kong project 
came from the Sub-Zero Wolf. I won the Sub-Zero Wolf uh, first place national prize. I think it was in 2005, 2006, I think. So I was very young, won that first place prize. Somehow, the American designer, interior designer, saw the kitchen, and we installed that exact kitchen as one of the five. Um, it was, it was a five-story house, and every floor, it was like a massive family. Wow. So every floor had a different kitchen look. Um, and ever since then, it's, I mean, the book has a ton to do with it. The book, expo the exposure of the book, doing show houses like Kipps Bay in New York City, um, the house Beautiful Homes, the one in Nashville, one in Atlanta. So a lot of that has been really great. Yeah. That exposure has been great. Okay. And, and we're so used to doing, 70% of my work is outside of the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. it, we're so used to it. We make it, like, the client really doesn't know. I mean, we send them iPads. We do FaceTime calls. Like, all this stuff is, it's so easy for them. So, so what? You're not sitting next to me in Atlanta. We can still absolutely do business together. Right. So, um, in terms of the book you just mentioned, mm -hmm. how did you become interested in becoming an author and talk a little bit about the two books you have out there and what you might have for the future with those? Oh, motivation for doing the book. Hmm. Um, I had some very special projects. I want, it, it is, I mean, let's be real. It's like the most expensive brochure ever. So that's, it's to get business, period. Um, the first book was 15 projects, 15 kitchens. It was meant to kind of pull the curtain back on the process of how I think and maybe some guidelines about axis, centers line, textures, ergonomic, like all the things that go through my mind when I'm designing a kitchen. And in the back of the book, I put um, my favorite thing. So it's kind of my Bible of the products that I love using. Mm -hmm. The second book, uh, Quintet Quintessential Kitchens and Spaces, I added bathrooms and closets to it. And that... Obviously, I'm not going to repeat the same things that I repeated in the first book. So I used the client process a little bit more. I used what their influence was, what, what they asked of me is kind of becomes part of the process. And then to make it a little bit different, my actually favorite part of the book is six of the clients, six of the 15 clients, in their own words, talk about the process mm -hmm. and their favorite things about the kitchen or the bathroom or the closet they, in their own words, talk about the story in the back. It's actually quite long, um, but there's a lot of emotion. Actually, the client in traditional home is in the back. And um, I'd say half of them, it's not even, like one of them is like a piece of furniture that I had nothing to do with, but I fit it. Like right. they told, it, told me about it and I found a place for it and fit it in there. Some of it is just about the love that, you know, I gave them a pl like the social corner sink. I gave them a place for their children for they can see I exactly what the sink is supposed to do. They can see eye to eye, have a conversation. They're having more family time because of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. It's not really the aesthetics of it or, you know, I don't love the knob or the light fixture that he picked, but it's really just exactly the point of it, the feeling, the saving time. That's what they love about okay. it. So what excites you the most about being a kitchen and bath designer? Like, where do you find your inspiration? I, I mean, I, I just said it. Honestly, like, we, um, again, probably because my scientific background, but we inventory everything. So I, I like to go and visit my client in their existing kitchen and either breakfast or dinner. Breakfast typically is the most chaotic. So I kind of like breakfast. And plus, I don't really, I go to bed at 9 o'clock, so I don't really want to be at a client's house at 7 o'clock. So I, breakfast, great. I go over there at breakfast, and I just see all the chaos. I see people bumping into each other. I see just everything that's a mess typically at breakfast. And we, we study all this. We ask the client. There's a good two-hour interview. We ask them... 
Um, tell me in the next five times you cook, tell me how many times you go to the refrigerator, to the cooktop, or refrigerator to the sink. Tell me how many times you open the dishwasher. Do you clean as you go or at all piles in the sink? Like all these types of questions. And just like if, I, if you were, let's say you're um, designing a floor or you're designing a ceiling for yourself, you're going to walk through Las Vegas and you're going to be looking down or you're going to be looking up because in the moment, you know, you're designing that thing for you. So if you tell your clients these specific questions, like I need you to pay attention to this, 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 and this, they will. Mm -hmm. And they won't even realize how many times they walk to the refrigerator or how many times they walk to the trash can, you know, whatever it may be. So they pay attention, they give you that information, and it's really just a matter of, uh, you know, analyzing it and figuring out the best plan, um, figuring out where everything goes. Some clients, they will tell you, some clients are organized, period, fine, great, just find a place for it, make it, you know, their new kitchen. Some clients will tell you they want to be organized, and maybe you do if you if you find if you give them a Tupperware drawer and a slot on the side with dividers for all the lids, they'll follow it. And then there's the clients that tell you they want to be organized, but they are messes. Like they can't. Even if you do that Tupperware lid space, right. they it's never go up there. It. It's all over the place. There's aluminum foil and dish towels in there, and it's a mess. So you got to then think. You have to find that out before you design the kitchen for them. Are they going to stick to it or not? And what you, you go to their closet. I mean, that's always a great place to look. And you see how messy their closet is. You open their drawers in their bathroom, you see how messy they are. And if they're really, really trying, is it because they don't have a home for it or a place for it? Or is it because they're just not like me? Um, so long answer to your question. I really get excited about fixing that. Mm -hmm. If I can, some, some you can't fit. Well, no, that's not true. Like the Tupperware thing, you don't do all those dividers. You just have a Tupperware drawer. I call it an electric room. Like you create a room next to the kitchen that all those appliances, because they're never going to put away all the stuff that's in the kitchen. So you create an electric room. There's plugs all the way down the whole back and all their stuff is plugged in and just sitting there. And they can shut the door and it's just a mess in there. <laughs> just a mess. And their kitchen will still look nice. So you have to think through those things. So anyway, I, I get really excited about fixing what I can fix. I get really excited about saving time. I get really excited about a client who maybe is totally burnt out of cooking because they hate their kitchen so much. It's so messy. Um, my husband doesn't like coming in here with me because we are always bumping into each other, whatever it may be. They hate it. And you fi if you fix that and all of a sudden they're cooking together again, the kids are part of it, they're interacting, they're facing the right way, they're not their you know, butt to the audience kind of thing, all that kind of stuff is happening. You fix that, that makes me, that I did my job and that right. makes me so happy. Okay, so let's talk about your new um, showroom. What made you decide to, um, for, as Nashville, for the city? How did that come about? Well, we, Nashville is... Um, it's on fire. It's uh, booming. We've always done a lot of business there. We actually were going to open a showroom there in 2000, I don't know, five maybe. And it was going to be in a high rise. They dug the hole for the high rise and then the recession came. So we just put the brakes on it. It really kind of all the uh, stars aligned. I met uh, Richard Aniskevich and... Uh, Ann Percelli, who I've known for years with uh, La Cornu, she, if, if any of you have the first book, her kitchen was the orange La Cornu kitchen in the first book. And she was, that kitchen is in Nashville, and she is, like, awesome. And with La, everything going on with La Cornu, um, we thought about doing business together and talked to Richard about being our uh, lead designer of that showroom, and it just kind of all worked out beautifully. Mm -hmm. Ann and I went shopping for a space. We were looking for like a two, 3,000 square foot space in Nashville, and we ended up falling in love with a 45,000 square foot space. So we bought this massive mop factory. That's literally what it was. And we divided it into 14 showrooms, and now it's Nashville's design center. 
um, and we're one of, the, one of the spaces, of course. And that's just so fun to bring that, because Nashville needs that. It's, mm -hmm. it's growing so fast. It, it needed a design center, and we're just uh, super excited about that. It's kind of fun being a de developer. Right. Um, so. so we they did the announcement of the Innovative Showroom Awards, uh, the winner, the overall winner. Um, so what would you say for this new showroom? Like, what, what's the innovation there? Well, um, if any of you know Richard Aniskevich, he, he's perfect for Nashville. Um, Nashville's very dynamic. Nashville, um, they call it Nash Vegas. Right. Um, it's got a little bling. It's got a celebrity kind of star power to it. And, rich, and it's very fashionable. So Richard is like perfect for that. So I think what this showroom brings, and you'll, Richard designed the monogram booth in the central. So you'll see kind of some of his uh, aesthetics. So it's definitely a marriage of Richard style and the Design Galleria brand as a whole. So it's, uh, it is pushing the boundaries of what kitchens are. Mm -hmm. There's closets, there's bathrooms, and there's kitchens. And it is, all, just like the book, all different looks. Mm -hmm. Technology is incorporated into it. Um, we do virtual reality with our rendering, we do renderings and we do virtual reality with our clients. So all that's integrated into it. It's gonna be a very light space, truly like residential kitchens. I mean, they are real ceiling. There's no drop tile, any of that. I mean, every single space is like a real residential kitchen. Right. Will so you... he's doubled the budget, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so will you be uh, hosting any kind of like community events or anything? For like sure, that? yeah. So I, it was fun. I got to design the whole design center, of course. So I designed this big lounge area that has uh, a stage, has all these, we call them nooks. They're like um, these little rolling homes that can be rolled around that four people can meet in. There's real comfortable furniture. It's very loungy. Uh, the whole building is be painted at black. Um, it's very, very Nashville. So yeah, it will be a legit design center with right. uh, functions, events, um, just a, a great place. Th there's not a, um, in Nashville, there's just not a location where designers can meet, uh, you know, uh, have events hosted that are design oriented. So it, we're, we're, we're glad to be able to provide right. that. So up to now, what would you say your, has been your greatest achievement? <clears throat> I, for sure, um, the team mm -hmm. that uh, we have assembled. So we have 34 in our firm, and many of them have been there at least 15 years. Mm -hmm. And they as all the designers in this room, you, I can't do it without them. They are all totally committed to providing excellent service to the clients. They're all very creative in their own right. They're all so intelligent. Um, so I, I thank God for my husband, Rick, because he handles really... Um, keeping them there and keeping them happy. Uh, I, you don't do that. I just don't, have, well, I just don't, I'm trying, I'm keeping my clients happy. That's like a full-time job. Keeping the clients happy. So, you know, Rick is the, he's the listener to the, and, and, and it's nice to be able to have, I mean, to have, you know, we work together. And um, this team is, they're, they're amazing. They all, I have a total of five designers plus myself, they're all very different, but they all, again, they have, we all have that same end game and it's making that, do, fixing those solutions mm -hmm. and making that client happy, doing whatever it takes to make them happy. So I'd, definitely my biggest achievement, our biggest achievement is, you know, keeping this core group together. And it's very important for me that they love to come to work every single right. day. Yeah, I mean, that's what everybody wants, right? right? All right. Yeah. So let's talk about lessons learned as you've grown your brand and your business. What's something you can tell us that you learned through the years? 
I think every time I think I need to discount my services in order to get the job, um, I always regret it later. So all of us, when you've been doing something a long time, you can't forget how your experience makes you so much faster and so much better. And you, yes, you, I, I, I mean, I can literally in one hour completely, you know, fix a kitchen that may take someone that's new to the business and, you know, a day mm -hmm. to do. Um, so I, I, to me, it's definitely about establishing this is, you can't be everything to everybody. So sticking firm, this is what I am a valuable, I'm providing a valuable service and sticking to it and not discounting yourself. I'd say that's, that's for whatever reason that kind of stands out. Right. Like when I have done that, I've really like kicked myself later. Why did I do that? Right. I'm, I'm worth it. Maybe this client is just doesn't understand that. Then they're not my client right. and another one will come. Uh, I'd say um, sometimes I get frustrated with um, kind of uh, maybe copycat designers, and I have I am trying to learn. It is an ongoing process. I'm trying to learn that the what is it? Flattery is right. Yeah. Um, well, I was gonna say if somebody a client sees a picture of one of your kitchens. A, you know, and has a different designer and says, I right. want it to look like this guy's kitchen. Yeah, and so, like, I, I, I've gone around the country when I speak, when I go on the book tour and stuff, I'm always speaking to designers, and I'm, I'm uh, that happens all, and designers will tell me that happens all the time, and I tell them, you know, you are the designer, you put your mark on it, you right. put your edge on it, and the client will respond to that. Like, don't just carbon copy something. Right. Um, Inspiration's great, but everyone kind of uses this word inspiration, and it's literally like, you know, it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, they're just copying exactly. But so I, I'm trying to learn that. I, I will tell you it's, it's hard. It's, right. it's hard. It's, uh, yeah, I put the book out there, of course. But it's to inspire and to um, empower and to lead by example mm -hmm. that, and the whole point of the book is that the, those spaces look like the people that live there. So other designers, it's not the same person living there. So right. make it look like that person, not just something that you see in a book or in a magazine right. or online. Make it look like that person. Take these extra steps to make it look that way. And, and when I do speak to designers, I give them ideas of how to make it look like them. And one, and one of them is, like I said, I always go into their closet, always. Right. I always study what they wear. And that's a perfect way. I mean, that is what people do. They, we put these costumes on every day because it's a representation of how we feel or how we want to feel that day or what we like. Mm -hmm. So do the same thing when it comes to uh, spaces. Yeah. So in terms of your clients, do have you through the years come across some that are just not going to work out? And like, what does that look like? How do you have that conversation? Yeah, I, I mean, I, ha I, I have a client right now. I met once in Palm Beach and um, the way he spoke to, I, I actually thought they were married. And the way he spoke to his girlfriend, I, within 30 minutes, decided... I can't be part of this. It's not my, I'm not going to be the person that's going to be like, you shouldn't speak to your girlfriend that way because I've just met them 30 minutes ago, but I just decided I don't, I don't need to be part of this. Right. So then I found out that they've only been dating two months, you know, so it's like, wow, you know, you're speaking to this. Other than that, I've, yes, I've had clients that had horrible taste. So it would take, I would, I'd, I'd get a design. How we work is I get a, I get a retainer basically. Mm -hmm. So before I start working with somebody, I get a, a substantial retainer. And maybe two or three meetings into it, everything I show them, they're like, no, no, I like this, I like this. And it typically is because it's too um, Fabergé egg or okay. it's just too, I'm just not that guy. Right. 
And I will just refund them their money and say, I'm just not a good fit for you. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you never burn a bridge. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think maybe once I just chickened out and I just priced the job really high so I didn't get it. <laughs> but most of the time I just will just say, we're, we're just not a good fit. Yeah. But no, it, it happens. And you got to, like, I'm a big believer of, you know, listen to those red flags. You see one red flag, maybe if you're needing that work, let maybe a second one go up. But after that second one, do not take that job. Because yeah. they're just going to be, it, you're going to have the United Nations flying. Right. So what does the future hold for you? Well, more product design. I'm going to save marriages with this <laughs> new sink. Um, uh, I, I, uh -uh. All right, wrap it up. <laughs> Good timing. That's right. <laughs> I've got a new faucet that I think is going to revolutionize cleanup. Um, I have totally enjoyed developing a design center. So there may be other cities um, that have that same kind of gap in the market as mm -hmm. far as luxury design center in a certain city that's, that's kind of growing quickly. So, I, I mean, I'm kind of loving the developer thing. Um, product design. And then, of course, you know, like I said, I think it's very important that I'm always designing spaces. Right. And... Uh, it just keeps me grounded and understanding the daily challenges that our clients are, are faced with. Right. Okay. So that concludes our discussion. <laughs> Does the audience have some, some more questions for Matthew? <laughs> Don't be shy. Hi. Uh, I wanted to know when the design center is opening, and uh, is it all interior and home uh, type design, or does it cover a broader range? Is there fashion? Is there uh, other product design? So it, the building is open. There's three showrooms open, and everyone else is kind of building out right now. And can, like ours is, we just got framed. Um, it is all design and construction, it's all, you know, fabrics, furniture, but because I'm influenced by fashion and art, I created these uh, displays in the front of the building. They're, we call them pop-up displays, but they're these um, boxes that local fashion designers, local artists, jewelry designers, there's actually some amazing wood sculptors in Nashville, so they'll have their products in the lobby, kind of like a museum. So the interior designers and the architects and the homeowners that come into the center, it's not just about being inspired or influenced by home products, but they'll see the relationship between fashion, art, jewelry, and part of the inspiration. Anybody else? Um, I was interested in your book and how you said at the end of the book you had some of your favorite things for kitchen design. As a kitchen designer, would you mind sharing some of those right now? Sure. I mean, I, I talk about um, my favorite appliances. I talk about uh, stone and how I'm madly in love with stone. So it's usually one of the first things. Uh, I pick the floor first and the stone is second. Um, I travel all over the country. There's different stone quarries and stone uh, suppliers that I love to use that bring in the most exotic stones. I talk about uh, hardware. I talk about hoods. talk about color, um, where I use color. But, you know, I, I'd say... One of the reasons I didn't put it in this, the, the second book was two and a half years after the first book. And I just felt like most of those things that, I mean, it's kind of like, like I said, it's like the Bible, my Bible. It, a lot of those things did not change. Um, and I just feel like they're kind of tried and true. And it, there's lighting, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of things in there. But it's, it's those manufacturers, those brands that I always go to.
I actually have both of your books, and <laughs> I'm curious because it seems like corners are your enemy. <laughs> you try to avoid corners in most of your designs, at least I assume so, um, to form symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, how do you convince people to give up that space and so you can create those really great focal points? Mm, good question. Uh, I mean, there are products, you'll see, I mean, you've, I know you know of them, Miracle Corners and Kidney Corners, I mean, and there's kind of ways to use these corners. A lot of times, I have found if you l get on your knees and show a client what it takes to get into those corners or how things, when you inventory their current kitchen and they realize the things back in that corner are things they have never used or forgot that are even there, you just, it's just, it's almost like that Marie Kondo way, like, let's just get rid of the corner so you don't stick things there that you're not going to use. Or you just use those great miracle corners, what are they, kidney corners, Le Mans corner, all these things that kind of use those corner spaces. Symmetry, uh, I am better at asymmetry after my trip to Japan. I'm still, though, generally a fairly symmetrical person because it just brings a sense of calmness to most of my clients. Um, there are some that we can achieve that sense of peace with asymmetry, but it is very difficult especially with a kitchen. It's very difficult. Did I answer you? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for getting two books. Matthew, I love what you said about the kitchens are inspired by the people that you work for. What was the inspiration for the Kipps Bay show house, which was done in that beautiful old mansion? Yeah, so show houses, yeah, you have to like, Show houses are unique in that you have to figure out who you think is going to live there or who is that person. And I, I have to connect to a personality. Um, the Kipps Bay Show House was this amazing mansion attached to the, I think it's called the mansion, right? The hotel yeah. attached to? Yeah. yeah. It's directly across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's the second floor of this, uh, of, of this building. And it was an amazing space. The, it was walnut herringbone floors that were already there and all these moldings, gorgeous space. So I had to picture who would kind of live there. And I definitely, I mean, clearly the person is extremely wealthy. Um, this person's very uh, right into the city scene. They love to entertain and cook. So that's kind of what I designed that space for. Most of my spaces are typically uh, masculine, but there's definitely feminine uh, materials or feminine colors introduced in that too. So it, the, it can kind of go both ways. Uh, I remember there's this, I don't have a picture here, but there's this beautiful mullion pattern on these dish hutches that I did. And it literally, if you look th across the street, it's the same mullion pattern in the St. Patrick's Cathedral and the windows there. And I kind of just took that put it into a mullion pattern on these dish hutches and then did them in high gloss lacquer to kind of make it not so traditional. Um, there's these light fixtures in the windows that are hollow tubes and I sliced the tubes on an angle and there's, I think I did them in acrylic, polished nickel and brass and they look like the pipes, the organ pipes at St. Patrick's Cathedral. That was kind of the inspiration there. And then I had these big circular uh, light fixtures that had holes in them that looked like, um, looked like something from the deep sea. But I had a client come in, I mean, not a client, a visitor come in. I think there was 20,000 people came through that show house. Had a, and I, told, I was telling the story about the organ pipes and the St. Patrick's Cathedral mullion pattern. And they said, oh, did you pick these lights because they look like the incense that the altar boys carry down the aisles? You know how those things, and I was like, no, but I love that. Maybe I did, I didn't realize it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I definitely always, in, in all these show houses, I probably do one a year, sometimes two. It gives me an opportunity to express myself or exactly without any kind of um, bias from the client. But it, it allows me to do that and I always do picture who lives there. Is it a family? Is it a single person? Is it an entertainer? Is it a bachelor? Like this picture right here is a bachelor. Um, you know, that type of thing. Awesome. I think we have time for one more. Hello. 
Um, so my question is, um, you mentioned uh, that when you got into product design that you got a lot of your inspiration from obviously the needs of your clients. Um, I came from a background where I did commercial and restaurants and I started doing kitchens and bathrooms and closets uh, in the last like nine, nine years, I suppose. Uh, uh, you said that it, when you came up with the design that you approached several different companies. I met Kim Lewis a few years ago and she said the same thing, that she was struggling uh, with, you know, she would find, uh, she would want to come up with the design and then she would have nobody to make it. What was that end result? Like, what did you have to present to a company or manufacturer in the U.S.? So I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we have to obviously look at other companies outside of Canada because we don't have uh, places that manufacturers that can make a lot of things. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest for a designer that's that has a design? Not to go through all the steps that you did. Well, I mean, I think it, I it always, did everybody hear the question, kind of like the process of getting working with a licensing partner? Um, it definitely helps if you already specify their product. You already have a relationship with that company. Um, and what you see is you love this company so much, but they don't have this. You know what that gap is. It could be, I mean, with La Cornu, I can't even believe that I convinced the French to let me take their iconic piece, you know, from 1908 and let me design a modern range. Like, I can't even believe they allowed an American to, you know, mess with their product. But they were losing sales to more modern versions of that range. Um, uh, Acto Tile, Art Fred, I mean, all the companies that I work with, there were just, I noticed there were just some gaps. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't find everything I needed from that company. So you present them with a solution and you say, hey, I know that I can sell this, I can specify this, and I know other people that will be able to do the same thing. I think it, it fills a void in your product offering. And you just have a really real conversation. I, I, you do have to be careful. Um, we have, we have not NDAs, non-disclosures signed before I present the drawings to them, and that does make them a little skittish, but it, it is the best way to protect yourself. It's not a big deal. I'm a believer in everything should be on one page. As soon as it starts going to two and three pages, people get very nervous. So just make something short and sweet on one page. Meet with that person at that manufacturer. Show them your design. Show them that you want to sell more of their product, that you want to fix a problem that they have, that you think they have. And, um, you know, you may, get a, you may get a deal that way. So it, it, it's not as... Um, you don't have to go out and hire a brand agent and kind of, a, I just don't believe you have to do that. I think you can work one-on-one -on -one with the manufacturer and it, everything works better that way. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, Matthew, for thank you providing all, for all this thank great you. information. Thank you. Hope you all have a great rest of your show. Thank you. We'll have new episodes of KB Talks coming your way soon. So make sure you are subscribed and stay tuned. Please be sure to send your feedback to nkba at flyingcamel.com. And remember to take a moment to leave us a star rating or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Stay tuned for a quick NKBA Minute. Brave New Business is a video forum developed to support and serve our community of kitchen and bath professionals. Each episode brings together the brightest minds, the change makers, and the problem solvers to interpret the information and offer insight about what we all need to know right now, from market analysis to virtual tools. Make sure you're following us on social media, at the NKBA, for information on how to register and never miss an episode. Brought to you by the NKBA, KBIS, and KBB Magazine.